So today's show will take you higher, hopefully make you smarter, because we like it when the Friday Power Lunch overflows with love as we build this community together to empower people to take action, because certainly we really need to take action, especially around voting. And that's what we will be elevating today to take you higher and to shine hope to uplift us all. So we're so glad you're here. Um, so to get things started, let's go there by meeting today's lineup. So I would love to first welcome Liz White from One Virginia 2021. Hey, Liz. Hello, thank you so much for having me. This is so fun. I know we're so excited to talk about gerrymandering, redistricting and what the heck is happening because as you say, <laughs> this is not over till the, the redhead sings. <laughs> I'm not gonna it. sing after, uh, after BJ though. I don't wanna follow that. <laughs> I know, man, that was really super awesome. So thank you, so excited to talk to you. And then we have the Andrea Miller, founding board member of Com Center for Common Ground. How are you, my friend? I am great, and this is making the day a great day. I know it, you're always good at that and you brought it in the room. We're so thankful that you put this out to your members. So welcome any new people in the room. You are on the Friday Power Lunch with Network Nova. So welcome, Andrea. We can't wait to talk to you about the democracy centers. Thank you. All right, and next up, Frank. Hey, Frank, all the way from Richmond. How are you, Frank Mosley, social entrepreneur and director of the Richmond Democracy Center. Hi, Catherine. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm truly honored to be with such a prestigious panel uh, and to have this wonderful Friday lunch with you all. So thank you for inviting me and look forward to the conversation. Do you have a beverage? Do you have some coffee or did you get your water? Just, just the cold water. That's all I need. That's good. Okay, you're going to need it. We're going to do a lot of talking. I can't wait to learn about what you're doing in Richmond. So thanks, Frank, for being here. Awesome to see you. And next up, we have... BJ herself. BJ Lark, are you there? She does not have her um, video on. So Let's BJ, you want to put on your video so we can put you? Well, yeah. we'll, All the um, way we'll come from... back to her. Um, okay. She doesn't That's have her video. Um, yeah, pop her up when she turns her video on. That's super. And, you know, we can just go right away to Reverend Wendy Hamilton. Welcome. You're a candidate for DC delegate to the House of Representatives in 2022. How are you? Uh, hi, neighbors. How you doing? <laughs> just across the river. Just across the river, just a bridge away. Just a bridge away. So yeah, I'm excited to hear about what you're doing in DC. I'm very much uh, honored to be here and very excited to share with you what's going on in the current city of Washington, D.C., soon to be state of the Douglas Commonwealth. So yeah, I'm you're putting excited. it down. You're putting the gauntlet down, my friend. Yeah. I love it. Well, thank you, Reverend Wendy, thank for you. being here. Is that, Absolutely. Reverend Wendy, is that good if I call you that? Yeah, Rev. Wendy's fine. Just don't Rev. call me late for dinner. All right. Okay. Oh, no, never do that. <laughs> we don't like to be late for dinner in here. So I also like to thank all our guests for being here. And of course, you all being in the room. And let's give a big shout out to our team of the Network Nova Friday Power Lunch team. Stair is here. Ambassador Buzz. Hey, Stair. We have Robin Warner, Postcards of Virginia, the show wizard. She makes it all happen. Of course, Rosemary Savino. How are you, friends? Show tech support. How are you doing? Good to see you. Oh, there she is. Hey, there you are, Sparkle. Good to see you in the room. And Louisa Borowski. She is the show news anchor. Glad to have her in the room as well. And um, while you're all on the screen, I'd like to share some interesting, fun bragging rights uh, about Network Nova. We just found out this week that we are a house resolution number 727. We are a uh, Network Nova was recognized in the, the house, yay, the Virginia assembly. And we were just recognized for our work on civic engagement and advocacy. And that was pretty cool. So I have to say shout out to Network Nova and everybody that's been a part of this journey. And we were recognized on the floor. And why that's important to brag about is we were doing this for five years. And you know, if you don't speak up, someone else, takes credit. So we're going to take credit, all these people in this room and the grassroots are working darn hard to make sure that Virginia stays blue and holds blue. So that's a little bit of love in the room since we're all about love and elevating each other today. 
So Louisa, are you ready? I'm ready. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. This month of August, it's all about the candidates. We're really ramping up so that they are going at 100% when we hit the ground in September to get people to start voting early. So the first thing I want to share with you is this week, our candidate of the week for the Virginia Grassroots Coalition is Fanal Norton, who I know is in the room. So, so excited to highlight you this week, Fanal. I will put in the chat information about how to announce this on social media in the toolkit. Um, the more we can get our candidates' names out there, the better we're going to be going into the election season. The next thing to note is it's canvassing season. So I hope a lot of people will be down in Virginia Beach. I'll be canvassing down there next weekend, but I'm going to give you some opportunities for canvassing this weekend for Dan Helmer, a couple weekends from now for Wendy Goditis, and then August 29th for Paul Syker, all in the Nova area. If that's where you're located, these will be not very far drives and a great way to spend one of your weekend mornings or afternoons. There's also phone banking. So if you are not ready to leave the house because you're getting those crazy bites that I'm getting from whatever those mites are in the trees, then you can phone bank for Nancy Guy on Sundays. And I'm going to put that link in the chat. And then we have two great fundraisers coming up in a couple of weeks. One is on August 22nd for Irene Shin. And she is one of our new candidates who is running um, in the Nova area. Um, and then we have an August 26th fundraiser for Wendy Goditis. So it is that time. It is time to start to get all of these campaigns running. And the best way to do that is by our support. Last thing to note is that we have a coalition meeting coming up on Sunday, which would be the 8th of August. And I will put the link on how to RSVP. We're going to talk about two things. One, for sure, we're talking about the elections. Ride Share to Vote will be with us. We're going to talk about relational organizing and how that's related to some of the stuff the DNC is trying to do. We'll have updates on campaigns. And then I'm talking to the new coordinator of the coordinated campaign um, at one o'clock today. So I will have updates from him as to what to expect um, this fall. We'll also talk about some issues. We're going to be talking about paid family medical leave, talking about the pipelines, and we're talking about critical race theory, specifically what can we be doing at our school board level to make sure that we are protecting education for everyone. So that's the plan. It's going to be, it's going to be a good week and just a lot of opportunities for action. Yeah, you made me itchy. I know. I'm sorry. They're, well, they're I have really to tell funny. everybody, I think they're called like oak mites. And yeah. my husband said that in their emergency room, people are coming in with all this itchy stuff. So if you're itchy, it, it's because you don't have bed bugs. No, you have some kind of, and they're from the cicadas, something weird. So, you know, good news yeah. is it won't happen for another 17 years to get itchy. So how about exactly. that? They're eating the cicada <laughs> eggs. And so that's why there are a lot of them. So as long as the cicada eggs disappear, they should disappear. We should be good to go in a couple of weeks. Yeah, always something. I mean, here we have the Delta variant. We have the rise of this. And for all of us that are vaccinated, this is such a headache to be drawn into itchy. And then maybe, you know, dealing with this rise of a very dangerous variant. So, so thank I mean, you, Louisa. You know, you that. thought last year was a challenge. We've got something new for yeah. you this year. It's, it's always something new, that's for sure. And we always have to be ready for it. So that's why it's really good to, everybody now knows why they're itchy if they didn't know. So how about that? There you good go. News. So our next guest, and because we're talking about gerrymandering, redistricting and voting, I mean, obviously these laws and Liz White, please come on up, there you are, um, really has to do with our democracy. We talk about the heart of democracy, keeping that beat going. There's different ways that voters are suppressed you know, for how they, when they hold elections. And then obviously in Virginia, we really tried to tackle this issue of gerrymandering with this whole redistricting thing. So we're so glad you're here. So give us the background. Uh, I know people may have thought because this passed the constitutional amendment, the commission, Virginia commission is formed. So what should we, what do we need to know uh, as the public needs to know going forward? Give us the background of what's going on right now. Sure. So you're exactly right that, you know, one Virginia has been working on redistricting since 2013. And I heard a lot after November, like, yay, we won, we're done. Um, 
And now it's the implementation phase and it's a whole different mission. So we've got uh, you know, constitutional amendment one passed with 67% of the vote. We've got this commission. It's the first one of its kind in the country. Um, it's a hybrid between legislators and citizens. Virginia is the first state to pass redistricting reform through their legislature without like a citizen's initiative and going directly to the ballot. Um, so they're, you know, they've been meeting since January. They are really starting to get into like the, the sausage making part. Right. And we, we get to see it because there's just this unprecedented level of transparency um, that we've injected into a famously like smoky backroom kind of process. Um, and they're, they're about a week away from getting census data. Um, we found out yesterday, the country found out yesterday, census data is coming on August 12th, Ooh. four days earlier than we thought. Um, and in Virginia, that's gonna start the 45 day clock. They have 45 days to draw House of Delegates and state Senate maps. And then they submit those maps to the General Assembly for an up or down vote. Uh, they get two shots at that. So if the General Assembly votes no, they can make changes and send it back. There's about a two week window in there. Um, if it deadlocks, it goes to the Supreme Court of Virginia. So we're really at a phase now. They just wrapped up their first um, set, their first uh, series of public hearings and they did eight of them all over the state. And now we're looking at these this couple week lead up between now and when they're gonna really start putting pen to paper, you know, proverbially. Um, and it's a huge opportunity for Virginians to be heard. There's still lots of ways to participate um, even, though the, the, even though we're between public hearings. Right. Um, and I'd love to get into a lot of them, but I would just really emphasize that this system is designed to build on public input. And for the first time ever, legislation was passed last year that requires the commission to honor communities of interest, among other things, among uh, protections for minority representation and protections against um, partisan favoritism. Um, but the communities of interest piece really is right. the key. Let's talk about that because when I, I'm going to put actually in the chat, if you don't have it at your fingertips, um, the website, Great. Uh, I don't know if you already put it in, but people can look at this website of where they can go and learn more about it. Is that correct there? I put it in. Yeah. And, and we're, so people need to know that they have input right now. And so tell us about the timeline uh, about that input. And so people know when to participate and it's, very interesting some of the questions and the level of difficulty give us the give us the story behind that uh sure so the timeline i mean i would say don't wait especially because the census data got moved up four days um i mean they are the census data comes in they need a couple days to you know put it all in the computer and get it all all of it ready to go and they are finalizing their kind of work plan like who's who actually you know jiggles the mouse around in the software and who's actually in the room and what kind of input comes in when. Um, so if you have thoughts on that kind of thing, mm -hmm. reach out to them. But the most important thing I think is to tell them about your community of interest. They are, I mean, legally obligated to honor communities of interest, but they can't honor a community they don't know about. And it's only 16 people. They can't possibly know everything. Right. And I keep hearing from people, well, you know, I don't have anything to tell them. I'm not an expert. I'm not a political expert. I'm not a mapping expert. I'm not a math expert, but you are an expert on where you live and they are not, there's nothing too obvious right. for you to tell them. Yeah. I mean, I noticed when I went in there real quick to look at some of these questions and I find it interesting because I guess you're, that's a part that seems real subjective to me, right? You're getting all this information. How are they then looking at all that information? I mean, when you get all these and, and, and how does that process work? That seems kind of interesting to me that, you know, subjective information, like here's my community and it's based on what I feel about my community, where it ends and where it starts. Mm -hmm. This is very interesting. I mean, is this part of something that you've all, this is how this all works? I mean, I just find this to be very interesting. So communities of interest is um, a pretty typical like metric and factor in national redistricting circles, um, all of us nerds. Um, so uh, 
not all states are, are legally required to honor them, but it is something that anyone working in this space has been trying to sh get information on to share with the commission. And it, you're right, it is incredibly subjective. I mean, we call it squishy. Um, right. But I think it's also intentionally so because communities aren't the same in Fairfax as they are in Wise County. Um, it's been very interesting to see public input come in. I mean, a lot of people feel like my county line, my city line, that's my right. community of interest. Um, but it could be anything as kind of concrete as like a racial, ethnic, or language group. Right. Or it can be something as small as your HOA, as your, um, your school district. That's probably a super helpful one, especially up in Northern Virginia. Um, and I know like I'm out in the suburbs of Chesterfield, a school district, that's probably my community, my HOA. And right. I like to tell people, think about what you would tell someone getting ready to move in next door. Where yeah. would you tell them to shop? Where would you tell them to uh, go to school? What kind of uh, faith communities are there? Right. What is the center of your daily life? And that's not too small to tell the commission. They don't know. They don't know. No, that's interesting. So that really is helpful too when you give those examples. I think people in the room and I think on the website, even having that idea, like people may leave out something because they just don't think it's relevant, right. right? But where you have coffee, what you like to do, if you have a park, if there's a historic graveyard, what, you know, all this, I mean, maybe even traditions, like your favorite parade that happens in town. I don't where know. do folks commute to? I mean, are you yeah. a town that stays put or are you a town that everybody goes up to DC? And if so, what road do they use? Yeah, yeah. So in, in the sense of testimonial testimonials on this what are what's attracting the attention of the people in the commission like what is getting that attention so i think i think there's kind of two categories that seem to i mean just literally reading like facial expressions seem to be moving the needle one is talking about the current maps and the current gerrymanders that people are living in um northern virginia has a thousand examples of mm -hmm you know, this, why are these two precincts over here? Why does this House of Delegates district have two precincts in Loudoun and everything else is in Fairfax? Um, and particularly because the delegates and the senators live all like all so close to each other, the lines get a little squiggly for undisclosed reasons. Um, but tell them, I mean, Delegate Vivian Ward spoke at a public hearing and kind of said, look at my district. I mean, it's not fun for them either. Um, so talking about the egregious gerrymandering that we all live under currently. I mean, you watch the citizens' eyes in particular get real big, and even the legislators' eyes get really big. I don't know that they know how bad the gerrymanders were in the past, especially around, away from their districts, and especially like just the degree and the specificity right. to which they are bad. Um, and then the other category, I think, are specific asks. People who say, keep Lynchburg in one piece, keep Fredericksburg in one piece, mm -hmm. keep, here's how I define the town of Annandale and it's a community. Um, and I think town lines are, you know, a little fuzzier than uh, cities and counties. Right. But if you can help them define where that community is, that's really helpful to them. And there's also community mapping tools. Um, yeah, there's on our website. On the website. Isn't mm -hmm. there a toolbox on that? No, and, and I, you know, what our show is about, obviously, democracy, voting, and all that access, and I think will be interesting to hear later with some of our guests coming on is making sure people that, that usually aren't the marginalized communities, how do they find out about this? I mean, a lot of times people that are working three jobs, doing the business of life, and already have a hard, to, don't even maybe vote or have a the voting is just not on their top of their list. They may not even understand what their district is. A lot of people can't even name their district. I couldn't until I came into this work. I so mean, how are, is there any way, because it seems like it could be, I'm just gonna use a really bad word, rigged just for one group to be totally vocal and loud and then yeah. all these other people not. So is there any way they're mitigating that? So I would say that by far, in my opinion, the biggest misstep of the commission so far is that they are only now bringing on a communications firm. And so there's just been minimal outreach to anyone, but of course that's gonna disproportionately affect marginalized communities. Yes. And the people who always know about this are gonna find out about this. 
So I know One Virginia and other groups like uh, VSET and the League of Women Voters and the state and AACP, and I know I'm leaving some out, yeah, but New a lot Virginia of groups, majority is New Virginia majority, um, have been working really hard to kind of fill that gap and message as broadly as possible um, right. to bring voices into this process who have historically been ignored, been marginalized, and thus suffer the consequences. Right, because then we're back to the drawing board, right? We're, yep. we're back to the same old problems, yep. really, when, uh, um, so that's good. And I think then a lot of leaders in this group, like from Andrea, we'll hear from later, this is where I think the responsibility falls on some of these shoulders to sort of be these spoke, spokespeople from these communities to make sure that we are trying to make sure that it is as fair as possible. So just to wrap up real quick, Liz, uh, tell us what we can do as a public um, in the Power Lunch participants can kind of help this process. Yeah. So I would say to, to leaders of other organizations, I mean, One Virginia is really trying to, we know we can't do it by ourselves, but we are trying to kind of create a body of resources. So anything you wanna copy and paste, anything you wanna forward, anything you have questions about, we'd love to help you get the message out to communities that you have reach in. Um, and then for individuals, for anybody, I would just say reach out. I know it is a super busy season with campaigning. Um, so we've tried to create as many ways to kind of lower that participation threshold as much as possible. We've got a two minute survey that you can take about your priorities for the maps. We've got a form you can fill out that directly goes to the commission and each commissioner. We've got right. resources about community mapping. We, you can, um, we've got our, our Sunlight Districts campaign on social media where you can make a selfie video on your phone and post, you know, about your community and post it online. All of this is on the homepage of our website and I'll put some links in the chat. Um, but I would just implore okay. you to reach out. That sounds like a good plan. And I know that you have your work ahead of you and we'll <laughs> see how this all plays out as we say. All right, so thank you, Liz. For thank you so here much. Virginia 2021. And then next up, the Andrea Miller, founding board member, the Center for Common Ground. Talk about a busy person who is really, Common Ground has done a lot of work this past year to I just writing, reaching out to voters, uh, making sure their vo voices are heard. And now we'd love to talk to you about what's, it seems, um, about that area of engaging voters and also this idea of the Democracy Center. I don't think a lot of people in the room know about that. We really want you to tee it up for us. Well, Democracy Centers are an idea that I came up with Reverend Terrence Dix of Georgia all the way back in 2015. So it's not a new idea. We didn't have funding to begin to do it on our own until literally at the end of last year. The whole idea behind a democracy center is we go deep into communities where there are underrepresented voters who can vote and normally don't vote. Communities where we have a lot of people with felony convictions who probably don't know how to get re-enfranchised and communities where they are definitely in pain. We call them pain points. And those pain points have really made them believe their vote doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether they vote for a conservative or a progressive, their lives don't change. So we're going in and looking at what is the community pain point? Can we begin to start them on a path to a solution? And can we help them understand it is not the president of the United States that has caused your problem or can solve it. It's your city council, county council rep. No, I mean, so let me ask you a question. Your Center for Common Ground, give people just a quick background of that. And because I don't know if a lot of people know exactly what you do, um, because I think that's really interesting and that work must have really kind of informed what the, the need for these democracy centers. 
Well, thanks for that question, Catherine. Um, we are a nonprofit. We are a 501c3. And it's really strange that we do not only voter registration, but get out the vote as a totally nonpartisan 501c3. In 2020, we sent 9.4 million postcards Holy to cow. voters in roughly 10 states. We made 1.7 million phone calls and we sent 2.9 million texts. And one of the things that we see from campaigns from political parties, when they do outreach to, we refer to folks as underrepresented voters. These are voters where when you look at elected officials, based on the percentage of the population that they have, they are not represented in the seats of power at that percentage level. I mean, look at the U.S. Senate and you're going now, there are zero African-American women in the U.S. Senate. Talk about being underrepresented. Wow. So we wanted to really help people begin to understand the civics. We don't teach civics anymore. And so people tend to believe when we look at voting patterns, we have a far bigger turnout for president than we do for state and local elections. And those elections generally impact your life a lot more than the president of the United States. No, I think that value of education is really important. And that's a perfect segue to bring up Frank Mosley. I know obviously you and Frank uh, working really hard on this. Frank, welcome. Thank you, Catherine, for having me. Yeah, let's get, let's get to that. Like when you hear, this is a big part when we talked last week about really the education piece, the civic engagement. So what, what is, what is your focus in Richmond on this project and how are you handling really trying to engage um, with people on the ground in these communities? That, let us know what, what you're doing there with this Democracy Center in Richmond. Sure, sure. So um, Andrew would tell you, be the first to tell you that each Democracy Center is unique in its own way and the same in its own way at the same time, right? And so uh, uh, what we have looked at is the way that other Democracy Centers have structured theirs. We have created kind of a hybrid. And because Richmond is such a large and widespread area, we have to figure out a better way to mobilize our grassroots and ground game, right? So we had to look at, instead of having one location, having several locations across the city to reach each one of the communities that we felt needed to really be engaged this election season. Because as, as you just said, all elections are local, right? And so politics are local, right? And so this election this year is going to affect them more so than the uh, the presidential election in, in you know, up, up and coming. What we wanted to do is really kind of look at the resources that we knew that they were in need of. Uh, Richmond has a huge a homeless population. Uh, it has a mental health and substance abuse population. It has a reentry population. These are all individuals who need services. Mm -hmm. um, and all of these have an overlap, right? So we look at, one, how do these services connect to legislation or to Mm. lawmakers and how can we hold them accountable by making these individuals who are coming in for these resources now civically informed and then getting them civically engaged by being able to direct their attention their 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 pain if you will yeah, uh, yeah. putting a face on it um, not because these individuals need to be held accountable once they're elected they need to understand that these individuals who are the constituents, voices should still be heard after they've come through and solicit them for their vote. And I think that a lot of those individuals in the communities, especially the ones we're trying to serve, feel a little disenfranchised because people only come through once in a while just to talk to them about their vote and then you never see them again. We want to be able to foster those relationships and be able to create platforms 
platforms so that individuals who are those representatives can have a direct dialogue with the constituents that are going to support them and be able to hear exactly what their concerns and needs are. We feel like being able to facilitate this in a number of ways, but using the technology that we have, right? right. Um, email banking, phone banking, text banking. And now we have a, an app that we're, we're trying to launch and roll out that uh, will allow individuals to be able to connect on through their mobile devices. So we're very uh, innovative and progressive. And just, I gotta get a shout out to Roxanne Rucker who is here today. Yeah. Um, she is the manager of all the democracy centers. She's, she's my boss. And, you know, it, she's so instrumental in kind of setting up and structuring these democracy centers. Uh, but, you know, we have a lot of good people uh, that are working with us, a lot of organizations that are coming together to build this coalition, this network to support the grassroots movement and to really mobilize these individuals uh, for this midterm election. Yeah, I mean, I love it because it's really what we need to do. Like, and we talk about the heart of democracy. It's when I'm listening to you, it's really about building those relationships. I mean, it is really about uh, being in the community with trusted people, um, not an outsider coming in, but really having those relationships where there's trust. And then, you know, I love how you're tying it to what matters in people's life, and then they can directly see you know, the outcome of their civic participation where they may have not thought it mattered. And- um, mm -hmm. Right. What I love, and I, before we get over to, to BJ, um, I love that the innovation of how you're going to get to these people. Tell us about the RV, which I thought was fabulously a great idea. So the, the RV is our, our kind of our tour bus, if you will, uh, but it is a, a mobile democracy center. Uh, we are able to go into communities. Uh, the, the RV creates quite its own uh, attention uh, and draw. People are interested in seeing what's going on. It's it's wrapped with um, aspirational voting and and uh, signatures by others who have who have uh, visited uh, others who have signed on right. as we have visited those communities. So. Uh, being able to register those individuals there, uh, tell them about the uh, the child tax credit, for example, uh, restorations of rights. These are things that are hooks that we're able to engage them with uh, and then let them know that their voices can be heard by registering the vote. Yeah. So it's, it's a very, uh, like I said, innovative and progressive way of, of kind of mobilizing our ground game, getting yeah. to where the people are and being able to create a presence that they can remember, an experience that they can remember. Yeah, I agree. It reminds me when we had to get um, crafty about how to get food to children because schools were closed and they decided why not keep the bus routes People understand that, right? And then they knew that where the food would be delivered. I think, use, you know, that's just really brilliant what you guys are doing. So, I, I, so thank you, Frank. And and let's call up. Let's have, add the, to the screen another wonderful person, B.J. Lark Bernadette. Uh, Be Bernadette B.J. Lark. Sorry, if are you? I don't know if your phone is your screen's on now, but we'd love to pull you up and talk about. Roanoke, you're in Gaines, Gainesboro community. And what I love about your perspective is finding those missing voters, how important it is. So speak to that. Hello, friend. Look, at great, great to see you. Yes, I'm sitting here in the park on my phone, a great place to meet people in your community. Um, as a coaching individual, when I show up, I am concerned about who's missing and why is there a people disconnect? We acknowledge the systemic inequalities and failures in democracy, but specifically referencing this discussion, I'm talking about who's missing in voting. We understand the core reason is because much of our history elections were determined not by who turned out to vote, but by who was allowed to vote. And so this was intentional, this was by design. And now we have to acknowledge the system isn't broken, but it was never intended to work for all of us. Systemic inequality and failures in democracy. And so I want to point out some um, specific things on today, the civically unengaged. So when I'm talking about who's missing today, that's the group I'm speaking of. There are two categories that I'm going to speak about. It's the unregistered or those that are registered and just do not vote. There's a simple resolution 
that I have learned from working with Roxanne and so many amazing people like Ms. Andrea and those on our team, um, we can make voter registration automatic. And, but there's also a proactive resolution for registered voters who just don't participate in voting. And that is outreach opportunities that exist. Um, as a culture and individual, I take full advantage and I create opportunities that will allow us to engage the unregistered population, including persistent, consistent outreach. Um, when I focus on resolution, I talk about proactive planning, how to connect and stay connected to both unregistered voters Register voters who do vote and unregistered and voters who are registered but just don't vote. We can get into a positive relationship and ensure that there is no longer missing people. Mm -hmm. um, let's turn this thing around and ask ourselves, why are we missing from their places? Where are they going? What are they doing? What matters to them? Let's start showing up where they are, even if that means showing up on their front porch to visit. Regardless, we have to build our connections and stay connected. Um, I want to tell you all, I learned that people who feel a part of things are more likely to participate in things, including politics. Individuals naturally feel that their duty most accurately and most effectively um, passionate toward who? Their friends and family who share ideas about where they want their communities and this country to go, or better yet, where it needs to go. So these individuals will likely not pledge an allegiance to any entity such as a nation, but they will give an allegiance toward you as a friend and also allegiance to their family. So you need to just let them know that you care about what matters to them, um, that sometimes you share information about what you both care about and that every individual is cultured and that means we can surely connect. I'll give an example. Um, um, I recall reading a book about eight years ago by Meredith Roth, such a great read, it's called Voter Turnout, but actually I read it because it was a political thing about participating. Um, in her study, she showed that low-income Black neighborhoods in North Carolina that had networks such as active churches and social clubs, they met up in restaurants and barbershops, they delivered as high as a turnout comparable to the city highest income precinct. Mm -hmm. That's good news for us. Just means that um, we need to connect. Um, um, in wrap up, I wanna share a story about, some people say, well, have you tried this? Have they, have you, what have you done to connect with people in your community? There's an elder in our community. Um, I won't name her today, but a lot of people will know who I'm talking about. She informed me when I approached her that she did not wanna be bothered with that kind of stuff. It sounded sort of like, um, you can't tell me nothing, child. But I asked if she could share her vegetarian chili and the good cornbread dish at an upcoming event. She showed up and she enjoyed watching others enjoy her food. This was foundational because we connected and we stayed connected in positive work. Right now today, this very same elder now works at voting polls. She became certified to register people to vote. And for the past two years, she has been proactive and engaging. So her yes. allegiance was most certainly not to this nation, but she cared about what I cared about. Yes. I cared about what she cared about. So engagement will allow us to take notice of who's missing, connect with them and stay in good relationship. And it's a win-win for us all. I get good yes. chili and cornbread and she'll get a song, but I most certainly did not cook because that would have scared her off. But um, <laughs> We, we all make sure we vote. And, no, um, I, I love yeah. it. People in the chat are loving your strategy. It's called the vegetarian chili and cornbread strategy. But I think what, you're, what we're talking about is valuing what people can offer, no matter, you know, and valuing what they do and then bringing it, that together um, and forming a community. Because we, we know even like when we do postcarding, postcard writing, those building of those relationships are what starts to make this group a group and they continue and they may even move into more advocacy. It's really about community relational organizing and staying in community. Um, you'll see a lot of times people just think they can just drop in uh, once a year to get people to vote. And that's not how, that's not how we're gonna make any change. So Bernadette, thank you and Andrea and Frank. But before you leave, I want you to play the game with us. We're going to pull up a Jeopardy answer. And the uh, Robin, for their 
Our answer is October 12th, 2021. Think on people in the chat can play too. October 12th, 2021. All right, I saw somebody in the chat. Anybody want to guess on the panel? Last day of voter registration. Woo! All right. That is, what is the last day to register to vote or update an existing registration for November 2nd in the general election? That is the question. So what's great about this knowledge is a lot of people in communities don't know this knowledge. And even when we're talking about redistricting in this commission, commission, it is making sure people understand how to participate. So thank you for all that you do on civic engagement. That's how we empower each other. And it was just lovely to hear from you guys. And I know people in this room will want to understand how they can get involved and how they could support you. So put any links, uh, Andrea, Frank, if it's donations, if it's starting a democracy center um, in certain areas, I think this is going to be the key to really making sure our democracy beats loudly, as we say. So thank you. Now we're going to go over to DC because we know that somebody is Reverend Wendy's here with us, and she is across the river and revved up, Rev, about That's right. It's uh, exactly right. Yeah, you introduce stand yourself. Up. <laughs> yeah, stand up. I mean, I love the work we're, you, you're doing when we were talking about empowerment and voting and democracy. Your yeah. name just came across my feed and I saw that we we're even Twitter friends and okay. you're running for, for delegate for, so explain, you, you know, you're a candidate and then also what, what you're doing about voting in your area. We know, give us your background. Yeah, so thank you very much. Yes, I am currently running for DC delegate to the United States House of Representatives for 2022. As I said earlier, for the city of DC, soon to be the state of the Douglas Commonwealth. So let me just make that clear. DC statehood is inevitable. So we're just gonna put that out there in the universe. But in addition to DC statehood, there are issues that are pertinent to DC residents and DC voters that we can also be advocating for. And that's what motivated me to run. Statehood and beyond. Once we become a state, what issues do we wanna be bringing to the table? What do we wanna be advocating for? You don't wait till you get something to prepare to have. It. You prepare now, and then when you're at the table, you pull out your menu. So that's part of what I'm doing uh, in running in DC and spending a lot of time with residents, encouraging them to get involved in the process. Those of you who may not be uh, very familiar with DC politics uh, here more locally, you, you wouldn't know it, but um, our turnout tends to ebb and to flow depending upon the issues that might be on the ballot. And I think that's nationwide. But what we found in looking at the data is that particularly during the midterms, there is a significant drop off. So we look back at 2018, the midterm elections then, 2020, as we know, was kind of an outlier. There were higher turnout. I think there were uh, dogs and cats that voted in 2020. <laughs> Everybody uh -oh. wanted to oh. Well, uh-oh, sounds like election integrity. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but uh, that being said, we look back to 2018 and that in that primary election here in D.C., out of the 493,000 registered voters in the, in the city itself, only 89,000 participated in the midterm primary. It was an 18% turnout. That's, that's really low. That's <laughs> so, low. That, that was really, and so for me, I'm looking at that like, what, what's this about? We need to dig into this data, but behind the data are stories. Behind the data are the numbers. I'm so loving this information and what you all are doing uh, in Virginia and all of these efforts that have been described today. I'm, I'm low-key jealous, but it's all good because I'm taking notes and I'm going to be reaching out to half the people that spoke already. Uh, but anyway, I yeah, really yeah. appreciate the efforts that you're trying to make with connection and connecting to voters. And what I'm hearing, the stories on the street, I'm hearing is I just don't see, I just don't feel where a difference, a tangible difference is being made um, in my life uh, by those who claim to represent me. So what's the point of turning out, right? 
Yes. And so doing a lot of um, education, of listening, of making um, connections with them. Uh, with I, I love the description of pain points. Got mm-hmm. a lot of pain points here um, in the district that I'm trying to address. So what we decided to do, what we uh, figured out we needed to do was in addition to running our campaign, we, we launched a campaign within our campaign and it's Midterms Matter DC because we wanted people to understand that of course we want your vote, but we need you turning out as heavily during the midterms as we do during presidential um, elections. This just makes our democracy stronger overall, but certainly in DC, we want your votes to matter and we're gonna do what we can to, to make those promises and allow you to hold me accountable if I don't hold up my end of the bargain. But right. midterms, uh, the local elections, you know, state, local, those are just as important, if not more in some exactly. cases, as was pointed out earlier, because those are the folks that can actually make some of the more tangible, immediate differences, right, uh, to your life. So we launched a campaign within our campaign, as I mentioned, midtermsmatterdc.com, and I'll put that information in the chat, just to make the case that yes. we want you to turn out. Here are some ways, here's why midterms are important. Here's, here's who's on the back. Sometimes people don't even know, I'm no. finding what's on, what are the issues? Who are, who are the candidates on the ballot? Sometimes people don't even have the information. So part of getting people to turn out and to participate is to um, increase the level of information that we're providing. So that's what we've decided would be a good outreach to our residents. We started that and it has um, it has been wonderful in terms of the feedback that we've been getting. We're connecting with our local, what we have in DC are called ANCs, our advisory neighborhood commissioners. Mm-hmm. And those are the folks who have the direct connection uh, to voters. And so we're finding that those are the folks that have the relationship. If I can work with the neighborhood commissioners, that's the direct line to the DC residents. Residents tend to trust those that are right there in the neighborhood before they trust necessarily even those that are sitting downtown, you know, in city hall. So that's what we're working to do. Get the word out, get the numbers up and get our folks in DC re-engaged in their future. Yeah, well, I'm going to say that's exciting. I love that's the love how you embedded it in your campaign. Um, mm-hmm. And that really intrigued me when I saw that. And I think about DC and the, the long fight for statehood, which was seems to be another way of really suppressing voting or taking, making almost people feel not empowered. Yes. You know, right? And, exactly. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think it's psychological, like why, why does it matter? And I think like what Frank was talking about and others in the room is just, uh, if we, if people do see that improvement and they see their voice matters, they're definitely more, they're definitely more interested, right? So right. I love that the Democracy Center has that list of services where if you're you know, finding with a pain point, connecting people to services and not just asking them just like, oh, will you vote for me? But I wanna right. help you and I wanna connect right. you to that. So um, I really appreciate what we, what we wanna do now, if everybody's, obviously we're, we're getting up to the hour, but we have a lot of questions in the after chat. So what I would love to do is if you guys can hang around a little longer, we will do some wrapping up and then, um, and then we will just get, we'll open up the room and people can ask these questions. Does that sound awesome? All right. Well, thank you. All right. So another great show, as we say, another great Friday. I, I want to remind everybody, of course, about the Women's Summit. Um, this has been the Summer of Summits, and we are really making sure that people are informed and why it's so important that we get out the vote in Virginia to hold the line, to keep it blue and to make this like, you know, there's so many changes we need to make uh, down in Virginia. I know we're in special session right now. Not only that makes voting easier, that but changes the election laws um, that, all, you know, this every year an election just will drive you crazy. So we know that there's a lot of changes that need to happen so people do stay engaged and don't tune out. Um, so the Women's Summit, Virginia Beach, August 13th through the 14th. We are excited. I think Melanie's, is Melanie in the room? There she is, Melanie, we're coming down to Chesapeake. 
Uh, can't wait to see you and others. We'll see Kelly Fowler, see Jeff Field, Scott Flax. We'll also be hanging with Fennell Norton. I can't wait to meet Fennell and I can't wait to see, um, I'm, trying, I'm probably forgetting a candidate, some of my friends that we've made in this room. I hope you will meet us out on Friday night to come have a drink with us or just break some bread with us as we say, but for sure Saturday morning, come on out to the Power Breakfast. And we'll really get some busy with some coffee and we're going to help these candidates win. Um, so yes, make sure that if you're interested, become a patron of the show, follow us on Twitter, YouTube and all that good stuff. And always stay for the after chat. And thank you everybody for being here. Have a great weekend. It's going to be a beauty. So yes, let's get this, run the credits and get started. <laughs>